everybody. Uh, we are going to get started promptly for maybe the first time ever um, at a CISA annual meeting. Um, so thanks so much for being with us. Uh, my name is Claire Morino. I'm CISA's communications manager, and I'm going to be shepherding us through our meeting tonight. Um, so first up to welcome you all properly and to frame the conversation for us a little bit, I would like to introduce Phil Corman, CISA's Executive Director, and Al Griggs, who is the Chair of CISA's Board. And I want to welcome you all to our 27th annual meeting. Just about everything is different these days. Certainly this meeting being virtual is one of them, but I can assure you that our staff has mastered Zoom perfectly, and I think we're going to have a, a very interesting meeting. But we want to hear, get your feedback. So if there's anything that, that you want us to know after the meeting, please do let us know it. Uh, over the past 27 years, CISA has confronted many challenges on behalf of farms and farmers. Tonight, you will get an overview of what CISA is doing now and what the impact is on farms and farmers dealing with COVID-19. I'm so glad you're with us this evening. It means a great deal to us. Now to Phil Corman, our executive director. Hi, everyone. I have to say, I really do miss seeing you all in person. And it already feels like a long time. But we thought we could start with maybe a little poll to see who might be in the virtual room with us. So Claire's posted it right there. If you could just answer it, it is multiple choice. You can't get it wrong because you're self-describing yourself and just hit the submit button after you vote. Um, so here we are Zooming. We have 100 people or so with us tonight. And um, when I think about this, I think it's good that we're all together tonight in any way that we can be. Um, and CISA has really grown. We've matured through the years. And I feel like now we really do confront some of the tougher problems. And you can see the results of the poll. Awesome that we have 40% of people who want to advocate on issues and do every day of their life. We have almost 30% farmers. We have business owners. We have people who love farm and food. And it looks like almost half the people do eat. And of course, we do have some elected officials and legislators. So thank you all for joining. So over these, this time period for CISA, uh, I feel like now we really have, in the last couple of years, fully understood that there are these deep-seated problems. Some go all the way back to the birth of our nation, such as racism, and other problems have come into the focus in the last few decades, like climate change. Um, COVID-19 has really brought to clear clarity the failings of how we've been feeding our nation. And for me, it's just like such a such an importance to, to really make sure that the local food system gets it right, that it's resilient, and that we're really getting food to everybody. So at CISA, our actions are, guard, are kind of guided by certain values, and they are like, we want to ensure that everyone who's growing food is respected by society, um, including farmers <laughs> being paid a fair price on their harvest, um, including all workers on a farm earning enough to support their loved ones so their families flourish. Also, every person who works in the food system is essential and not expendable. And every person has a <coughs> right to personal protective equipment, to testing, to sick leave. And ultimately, of course, we want to ensure that local food is available to everyone in our communities. You're going to be able to hear more tonight, to dive deeper into our work, and we're gonna be posting a, in the chat a link to our annual report, which you're the first ones to see it. Um, but really tonight is about sharing how urgently and passionately our local farms have acted to get food into our homes, onto our tables, and also to share with you what are some of the challenges that they see and they're experiencing by this pandemic. On to you, Claire. All right, thank you. Um, so. I'd like to introduce our panel, uh, who are each going to share their perspectives on how coronavirus is affecting local farms and our local food system. 
Um, and I have just a couple of housekeeping notes before we start. We are gonna follow their remarks with the question and answer period. So please feel free to drop your questions into the chat as we go. And we're gonna do our best to answer all the questions we can in the next hour. But um, this isn't your only chance to interact with us. So if you still have questions that are unanswered or resources that you're looking for uh, at the end of the meeting, you can always reach out to us at info at biolocalfood.org. Um, my coworker Noah Boston will drop that email address in the chat now, so you have it. Um, and at the end, John Robinson, who is our vice chair, is going to close the evening with a vote on CISA's new board members. So please stick around to help us complete that piece of business at the end. Um, and Noah will drop a link to the slate and their bios in the chat now so that you can take a look at them. Um, all right, so we are joined by Margaret Christie, who's CISA's Special Projects Director, Ben Clark of Clarkdale Fruit Farms and a CISA board member, and Caroline Pam of Kitchen Garden Farm and the brand new Sunderland Farm Collaborative, who is also a CISA board member. Um, so up first, Margaret, I know that you have compiled some thoughts on how coronavirus is affecting local farms and our local food system. So I'll turn it over to you to start us off. Okay, thanks, Claire. Hi, everybody. I'm, it's, I'm really sorry not to be in the same room with you all eating dinner together. And also, I'm really glad that you could join us in this format in these circumstances. So I want to give a quick summary of some of the key ways that the new coronavirus is impacting farms in our region. And then you'll get a chance to hear directly from a couple of the farms that are really doing the work to figure out how to respond in this situation and keep getting food to us. And I want to remind you that um, if we mention something and you want to know more about it, you know, put your questions in the chat and we will try to answer them. So the first big and really obvious thing about changes that are impacting farms are the huge uh, shifts in the marketplace, right? So, you know, restaurants are closed mostly, schools are closed, colleges are closed. Those are all, you know, big, loyal, and important buyers for our farmers. Some of them are not totally closed, but often they've had to change, you know, how they're serving food, exactly what they're serving, and that kind of thing. So it, it's, and, and in general, they're serving and buying a lot less food. So that's a big change. Farmers markets, our winter farmers markets, almost all closed really quickly after the beginning of the coronavirus because a lot of them are indoors in the winter. Some of them are in places like senior centers, like they shut down. And we have now been spending a lot of time helping summer farmers markets negotiate permission with their local boards of health to be able to open up and then figuring out new safe shopping protocols. So we're really excited that those markets are opening up. There's been a great response from consumers, but it's been a big effort for a lot of people to, to make that happen. Um, and then the last piece I wanted to mention related to these changes in the markets is that a lot of farms rely on different kinds of events. So whether you're growing flowers and selling them for weddings, or you have you know, on-farm dinners or festivals or other events, a lot of those are not gonna happen at all, or they're gonna be much smaller, or who knows what's gonna happen in the fall. So that's a lot of changes that farm businesses have had to negotiate. Um, and as we've seen at the national level, it's not really that simple to take a, you know, a food item that you were going to sell through one channel and suddenly like shift it over and sell it to someone else. Um, although you're going to hear from some farmers who have figured out how to do that in a really remarkable way. And there's lots more who, you know, we couldn't have them all on our panel. Um, but to give a little bit of an example of, you know, the, the kind of the lift that they've had to make. Um, so if, if a milk processing plant puts a lot of milk into those little school size containers or into what's called bag in a box, which is like the plastic bag of milk that you put in those dispensers that you got used to get your milk out of in the school cafeteria. They can't necessarily just suddenly start putting it in gallons or half gallons that we would buy at the store because maybe they don't have enough of that packaging or the filling machines don't have the capacity to do a whole lot more of those. Whatever, it's a, it's a bottleneck and it's something you have to figure out and you can't just turn on a dime. Similarly, if I'm a farm and I sell the restaurants and colleges and now those, those places are closed, it's not like you can just be driving the truck down the street and you're like, the college on the left is closed, but I'll just turn right to the grocery store um, because those grocery stores are getting their products 
from other people. And, it, and again, it just takes time to figure out where are the gaps and how do we fill them and how do we get that food there? So it's, it's a big challenge. The other thing about this is um, farms are figuring this out right at the time when they are taking action that has an impact on the whole season. So I think a lot of us are spending a lot of time saying like, there's so much we don't know, like everything's really uncertain. What's gonna happen, you know, next week? What's gonna happen in the fall? And farmers need to figure out, you know, in the last few weeks, how much of what things to put in the ground. And those decisions and actions have an impact on their whole season. But they're doing that in this atmosphere of enormous uncertainty about whether they'll have the workers to manage those crops and harvest them and whether there'll be any place to take them when they get them out of the ground. So they've just had to like forge ahead with this very imperfect information. So the next thing I wanna to touch on is the issue of worker safety. Of course, our local farms and food businesses and grocery stores all over the country are having to figure out like, how do we do all the work that we already were doing in new ways that can keep people safe? And we know that the guidance has changed pretty often. And so it's been a little hard to keep up with what are the right things to do. And like a lot of other businesses, they've had a hard time accessing the gear and the, the equip supplies that you need to keep everybody safe. I had a farmer a week or so ago who told me his bookkeeper spends four hours a week looking for masks and sanitizer. And that it costs a lot more than it used to cost. So one of the things we've been doing at CISA is um, trying to coordinate with our legislative delegation and other partners to organize coordinated buys of the of PPE so that every farm isn't having to put in you know that four hours um, looking for the gear. The other thing we've been working on on this front is um, making sure that people who work on farms can get tested for free and we're really pleased that at the Big E where they have a testing site that's supposed to be testing essential workers they've now added people who work on farms to that list. So Luckily, we have more and more places, you know, where you can get tested. Um, I think the other thing, just to echo what Phil said at the beginning, another thing about worker safety is it's a real example of where the pandemic is casting a sharper light on many of the inequities that already existed in our society. And it's been really clear in the last few weeks that many of the people who get sick from COVID-19 are the people who have to leave their houses and go to work. And a lot of those people are growing and processing and selling us our food because there is no other way <laughs> to get food. Um, so we've really been brought face to face with the, the idea that the people who we're now calling essential are also historically and currently often underpaid and undervalued and treated as expendable across our food system. So I think when we all keep saying like, the world has really changed. It's never going to be the same. You know, it's our job to make sure that some of those ways that it's different mean that it's better to address some of these problems. Um, the last thing I want to talk about before we turn to the rest of the panel um, has to do with government relief efforts. And the sort of short story here is that the federal business relief efforts um, have really been of mostly very little help to New England farmers. I think in a lot of ways, they have not worked all that well for a lot of kind of main street businesses, but even the programs that are designed um, to help farmers really are not designed to help farmers in New England. So we have spent a lot of time at CISA trying to help people navigate those programs and it's very disappointing um, that they don't work better. Uh, there are some bright spots. Michael Terra Farm, which is one of the farms that has coordinated with other farmers to do a home delivery service, they got a contract to work with the food bank to distribute food boxes um, through the food bank. So that's great. It's not, it isn't all bad news. The other place where there's really good news is at the state level, where there really are going to be, I think, some new programs that are going to be very helpful. We just have learned that there looks like there's going to be $25 million being distributed through our state Department of Ag Resources that will help farmers cover the costs of some of the extra things they've had to do because of the pandemic and also be a real investment in infrastructure for local agriculture. So that is really exciting. There's also some good state level efforts to connect local farms to emergency food distribution, which of course has grown and grown and grown. And that's something we might be able to talk about more in the chat. So the final thing I want to say is that 
although our federal government has not done a great job of, of recognizing the value that local farms bring to us, our farms are demonstrating it to us really well at this moment. And people who live here in our region are really recognizing it. So we've seen that in the huge demand for home delivery and curbside pickup and CSA shares and the enthusiasm of customers at farmers markets. Um, so I think our job, and I don't mean just at CISA, but I mean all of us, our job is to sustain that interest. So if you know people who have discovered you know, the pleasures of getting food from a farm in their neighborhood or in the next town at this moment, we all need to be reminding those people that to keep those farms in business, we have to keep supporting them once this is behind us. Um, so now I wanna let you hear from the people who are really doing the work to bring us all that food. And so I'll, I'll turn it back to Claire. Great, thank you, Margaret. Um, lots to dig into there. And so I'll remind you all that if you have thoughts or questions, the mechanism we're using to hear from you is the chat feature. Um, so feel free to pop your questions or thoughts in there as we go. Um, next, I'm gonna turn to Ben Clark. Ben, can you tell us a bit about your farm and share some of your perspective as a farmer that's still preparing for the season and what you're thinking about as a business that sells directly to the public um, at your farm stand, through Pick Your Own, at the farmer's market, um, all of those outlets. Sure, thanks Claire. Um, so uh, I came back to the farm 14 years ago um, and uh, got involved with the CESA board. I'm actually, this is my final, final official meeting with CESA after uh, nine years on the board. So. Um, it was it was a great time and, and I really got to know the people and, I, and thank you Claire and Margaret and Cisa and everybody else on staff was listening um, and a great board to serve with and, Al, and Al's doing a great job now. Um, and I just want to, um, I'll speak a little more generally as Claire said is, is we were fortunate at our farm is that we had actually had our last winter farmers market um, in March. Uh, just before or early March before the shutdown and we actually had closed our store. Um, we seasonally clo close in March anyways, because um, we're out of product. Um, we had just closed um, the first week of March. So we fortunately had not been impacted by having to pivot immediately, like um, Caroline will talk about with Kitchen Garden. Um, uh, and, and the fruit industry as a whole in the state, I'm, I'm also the, the president of the Mass Fruit Growers Association. Um, and uh, overall, growers were in a good place. A lot of, a lot of folks still did have storage crops um, and actually made connections with Mike Terra and with Caroline and the Sunderland Food Co-op. Um, so that's been great in terms of moving, moving product. Um, but a lot of growers were actually in a good place where we have had time to prepare for uh, the season. Um, and I've been on weekly, just to, just to echo Margaret, um, the state really has done a great job. I, I, the, the Baker administration, um, I've been on weekly calls with Phil, um, with I know Ashley Randall is um, uh, deputy um, commissioner is on the call for MDAR um, and with the commissioner of Ag, John LeBeau, and, and they've been doing a really a great job in, in weekly um, outreach meetings to stakeholders, keeping us updated. Um, as Margaret um, mentioned, their, their guidelines that they've been putting out, um, that was really how the farmers markets were able to get going is, is the guidelines that, that MDAR put out, which were mirrored by the Department of Public Health. Um, and then markets have been able to use those successfully for the most part, um, convincing local boards of health uh, that markets are, farmers markets should be uh, allowed and that they're essential businesses. Um, and that those, those are continued with, agri as Margaret said, agritourism, in, in the fruit tree, in the, in the fruit growing industry, um, there's a lot of, lot of concern because um, our farm, not so much, but, but a lot of farms, especially out east in the state, um, are large pick your own operations and they rely primarily on people coming to the farm and thousands of people on a weekend and selling donuts and everything else. Um, and that's a, that's a big, big shift to be making for them. I know one farm um, in Northboro that had a successful uh, couple weekends where they've actually had um, people drive through the orchard to see the blossoms, which are currently in full bloom. Um, and then they pre-placed orders um, and pick them up um, as they exit the farm, they can pick up baked goods and other things. Um, so that's one model that farms are looking at. And we're actually looking at that for our farm, um, having an option for, for drive up and pre-order, which as, as Caroline, Caroline might, attest to is, is it's not something that any farm was really 
I mean, some, some people have been doing it. And I know Kitchen Garden had done some, but for the vast majority of farms, we had not had any intention of doing an online ordering. Um, farmers markets and farm stands are much based on people coming, browsing, seeing the product, talking to the farmer, you know, having the experience and picking out um, the product, um, you know, you're getting, you're getting to browse and, and, you know, leisurely shop um, and getting, luckily we have a farm stand and we, we will be opening normally um, and having people come here and see the view and they can build, buy, it'll just be a different process. Um, and then, excuse me, just speaking to, um, to Claire's um, um, inquiry about the farmer's market, I'm also on the board of the Greenfield Farmer's Market. Um, that market has been going for 45, over 45 years now. Um, and we have a really good relationship with the town, fortunately. Um, the mayor and um, the Department of Public Health, we got in touch with right away when we knew there were gonna be changes. Um, even before the MDAR document came out, we were already having conversations um, and they were very encouraging with working with us to make sure it happened. They recognize that it is an essential. And that was something too with, with the governor's office um, coming out early on with the essential farms are essential businesses um, and recognizing the, the value of food security and food access. Um, so that's been, that was something that was really helpful. We were one of the first markets in the state to open, um, uh, and at least in Western Mass we were. Um, I know Copley Square and Amherst and Northampton are, are now opening or they have opened, but the big thing is, is communication. We, we had a good group, we have a really good manager, um, and actually we're fortunate that Devon from CESA is also on our steering committee. So, so she's been really helpful um, in terms of, you know, passing information along, things that are coming down that um, it just shows, you know, CESA has been really helpful, you know, our market and then basically using our market as a sort of a template for others in the area. I know Ashfield is, and, and um, Conway, other people have been coming down to check out. And it is a different experience. I mean, anybody who's been to a farmer's market in the last couple of weeks, um, it's changed from a social, um, you know, gathering place, which is what the market generally is, to an essential stop for food. So um, we're, people are happy to be there. They're thankful that we're there. Um, and we're thankful that they're coming out. Um, farms are doing pre-orders, trying to do pre-orders for um, pickup at the market, um, but there still are a lot, a lot of people that want to come and look at, you know, what the selection is and pick out what they want to get. Um, and, and that's fine. It just is a different process here. And, and we're also fortunate with markets is that they, where, when this, uh, the virus hit is that we had time to ramp up and people are prepared from going to grocery stores. They know that you have to wait in line, we have to wear masks. Um, so for the most part, it's been it's been a good process. We're still learning. It's only our third week that we that we just passed here, um, but overall, um, I think we're very fortunate. And and a lot of the help really is going back to CISA. I mean, the the communications and you know ensuring farmers the getting testing is a huge thing. I know our workers were relieved to hear that. They, nobody has taken it up yet because it's that we we've been really good on monitoring um, on the farm, um, but knowing the option that all farm workers can go get tested um, is, is huge because, you know, we, we need that, we need to know if someone gets sick, you need to be able to quarantine and, and you know, lock it down on your farm so it doesn't spread. Um, and, and just the, the general help that CISA has been, has been great. And the last thing I would say is with CISA, with, which Margaret, I don't believe mentioned was the um, emergency um, farm fund, which CISA established several years ago, dealing with weather related um, emergencies and has used um, its zero interest loans um, with a three year payback um, and up to $25,000 is what the loans were this term. And these were for coronavirus related. So basically economic injury, um, which some farms haven't fully experienced yet, um, but they're getting ready for the season. Um, and so, I, and I can't recall the exact number that we did, but Phil could share that. Um, but the, that, the organization was able to provide those loans to people who really needed them and couldn't qualify for some of the federal loans um, or were, were you know, really tight and so it's a quicker process. So anyways, see, that's another way that CISA has really been helpful and I'm really thankful for my time uh, serving on the board and look forward to future engagement as I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure I'll stay involved. So uh, that's probably it unless uh, there's any questions, Claire. Thank you, Ben.
Um, yeah, just quickly on the emergency farm fund. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, I'll note that this round of funding, um, there's been $183,000 distributed to 13 farms and that this round of funding was done in partnership with the Franklin County CDC and PB Grows Investment Fund. Um, and that new partnership enabled us to really increase the pool of funds available to farms. Um, and we're gonna be opening up the Emergency Farm Fund for another round of lending on June 1st. Um, so if there are people listening who that would be a useful resource for, please stay tuned. Um, and we'll be announcing that uh, in a week, my goodness, June. Um, all right, so up next is Caroline. Um, Caroline, can you tell us a bit about your farm, maybe under normal circumstances, and share some of what I assume has been kind of a wild ride for you over the last two months as you have adapted so enormously to this crisis? Yes. Um, so I own Kitchen Garden Farm with my husband, Tim Wilcox. We're in Sunderland and we have a 50 acre organic vegetable farm. We grow a wide variety of vegetables. And until approximately two months ago, we were selling exclusively wholesale. We had in previous years done CSAs and sold at farmer's markets. Um, but you know, three years or so, we had transitioned entirely to selling wholesale to stores and restaurants uh, throughout the region. Um, so we are a year round operation. We grow in greenhouses, salad greens. We store a lot of root vegetables. Um, we also make sriracha and salsa and other uh, value added products from our own ingredients in an on-farm kitchen. So um, when this all happened in mid-March, um, well, it obviously was happening a long time prior to that, but that was when it really became clear that we had to change how we were operating. I had about 10 to 12 people working full time at the farm. Um, and we initially decided we had to just stop working. I paid people to stay home that first week of March 16th, I recall, just wanting to make sure that nobody on our farm was symptomatic and just sort of figure out how we could safely operate, if we could safely operate in this um, circumstance. And this was before a lot of the guidance had come out. So we were just navigating it on our own, reading all the articles, all the science, trying to understand what um, was possible. And then we gradually reintroduced people coming to work and had people working independently, you know, one person harvesting alone in a greenhouse, one person working alone, you know, seeding in a greenhouse, one person washing alone. Um, and we had a lot of Zoom meetings with our staff and just sort of hashed it out uh, on an every other day basis, pretty much, you know, what is your comfort level? What is your experience? What are you reading and understanding? How should we proceed? And we ultimately have, um, you know, even dating back to then and still continues now, um, we work in a sort of small group pod system on our farm where we have our small harvest team and we have our small production team and we have our kitchen team and we don't really interact with the other groups um, in order to sort of insulate each small team from potential risk. Um, you know, the, the biggest scary thing for us was uh, the thought of somebody being sick on our farm and then everybody having to not come to work. And, you know, when it's springtime and you're planting and everything is so crucial every day on the farm, um, it just seemed a very scary concept, um, you know, to have people risking themselves coming to work and interacting with one another. So we also talked a lot about everybody adapting their behaviors outside of work. Um, but this is all ancient history at this point. Um, so we determined very quickly that, you know, the most important thing for us was that we wanted to be able to continue to grow as much food as we possibly could, not change our crop plan. We were very aware that um, with the restaurant closures, we did not know what our markets were going to be. We did not know exactly how we were going to sell the vegetables, but we understood that the need for the local network and the local production system was more important than ever with all of the disruptions. So. That was our resolve, that was our mission, was to find a way to continue to, to keep working and keep people safe. Um, so that's, you know, normal farm operations. And uh, we came together with a group of other farmers right here in Sunderland. 
uh, just sort of to have a brainstorm session, you know, as other wholesale farmers who rely on sales to institutions and restaurants for a huge portion of what we grow. Uh, how are we going to stay afloat? How are we going to find markets for our produce? Um, so I, I had a you know outdoor porch meeting with Warner Farm, Dave Wisman, and uh, Emily Landick from Riverland Farm, and we decided in one conversation like let's try selling, pooling, our, pooling together our farm's products, which are very nicely. Um, you know, complement one another. We had not a lot of overlap in the things that we grow. Warner Farm is known for their asparagus and strawberries and corn, and we grow a lot of different specialty vegetables, and Riverland grows a whole different slew of vegetables. So together we decided that we could um, list our offerings together uh, in a home-delivered, um, safe, contactless, online pre-order format. And uh, a week later we delivered our first 400 orders that first day. Uh, we did not at all, this, so this is Sunderland Farm Collaborative is what was born from that conversation. Um, and it has completely consumed my life <laughs> ever since. Um, but yeah, so after that first week, we also started uh, hearing from other farmers. Um, you know, I know and talk to a lot of other farmers in the area. I administer the Pioneer Valley um, Farmers Google Group. Uh, which is just sort of an information and knowledge resource sharing um, listserv. And heard from a lot of other farms who were, you know, Maple Line Farm at that moment with all of the institutions and schools closing was dumping milk and didn't know how they were going to sell it all and had home delivery customers from their previous, um, you know, business model asking if they would take it on again. So a lot of those customers were sent over to us and we are now doing, it depends on the week, but between 600 and 900 um, orders uh, per week. And it's about 3,500 unique customers at this time that we're serving. And we do home delivery uh, serve, you know, offering products from 30 different farms at this point. So a lot of our, you know, neighboring farms. So we have milk and cheese and uh, locally grown and milled flour from ground up grain, um, many different vegetable producers, uh, you know, some foraged items from Lakeside Organics. It's just a wide offering and we're delivering in towns just um, both sides of the river um, from East Hampton up to Greenfield. And then we've partnered with a bunch of other businesses who were um, able to offer a distribution site for a pickup order. Um, Initially, we partnered with Sutter Meats and Corsello Butcheria, who source locally raised animals and process whole animals. Um, but they quickly discovered that demand for local meat was so huge with the disruptions in the normal meat supply uh, that they just didn't have capacity to accommodate, you know, the number of boxes that we were looking to distribute through their facilities. So we've now partnered with a couple of breweries, um, Abandoned Building Brewery in East Hampton and Progression Brewing in Northampton and Millstone Farm Market right here, which also has a really great butcher counter um, and the Leverett Co-op. Um, so just finding ways to use our network and partner with other uh, businesses um, who had a need to either sell their products or drive business in this weird, strange takeout environment. Um, but it's been really amazing to see all these people who write to us and say, you know, they have always wanted to buy local food, but didn't find it convenient, couldn't make it to the market. You know, I don't know. It's just been a, a new opportunity, a new way to find um, people who are really, for the first time, some of them, um, discovering how important it is to have a really robust network of local production. That's my broad summary. <laughs> Thank you, that is a on. lot of work. A lot of work boiled down to a quick synopsis. Um, so I am going to start off with um, a couple of questions um, and uh, just a reminder, feel free to pop up in the chat um, if you have questions that you want to ask. Um, so I want to start, maybe I'll build on what you alluded to, Caroline, with a, a question for Margaret about the what's going on with meat production in the country. 
Um, so Margaret, I think many people have been reading in the national use news about how the coronavirus outbreaks at major meat processing plants have forced them to shut down and how that's affecting the national meat supply. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, what this highlights about our national food system and what we've been hearing at CISA about how that's playing out for meat farmers locally. Yeah, I think there's, there is a lot that we could talk about here. Um, so I, I guess I'll start with just a few points. Um, large industrial meat plants are not safe places to work. They weren't safe places to work before the pandemic and they're even less safe now. And often the people who are working in these plants are the most vulnerable people, you know, with the fewest options. So that's a problem that we needed to address before the pandemic and, and now it's really in our face. Um, and our system of producing meat at a national and a global scale is focused on driving the costs of that meat down or maybe a better way to put it is focused on externalizing, you know, as many of those costs as we can or turning something that used to be a resource like manure into a toxic waste product. Um, so instead of paying what it costs to produce meat well at the grocery store, we're paying the costs of producing meat badly in other places. Workers are paying it in poor health. We're all paying it in things like antibiotic resistance and in damage to our environment. So again, those are big problems we have to fix. We're also seeing that our system that really prioritizes efficiency and low costs is really inflexible. So, um, you know, in order to be processed in these plants, hogs and chickens need to be a very specific size. So there's a disruption of our bottleneck and it causes these cascading effects because, the, you know, the pigs grow too big. Um, so there, those are lots of issues that need, you know, much more comprehensive solutions. Um, locally, as Caroline said, there's been huge demand for meat from local farms, and that is a great thing. And, you know, again, we hope that that um, continues. Our own, you know, our own systems aren't immune to the problems of big chains and bottlenecks. First of all, you can't just produce a pig or a chicken, you know, overnight. Like, they have to grow. And so we can't suddenly produce a lot more our slaughterhouses are also trying to figure out how do we keep people safe? And that may mean that they're doing things, people are more spread out, some people can't, aren't able to come to work for all of the various reasons why people might not be able to come to work. And so they may in fact be slowed down. And we know that you know the slots for meat processing, which are often hard to get in the most popular times of the year in the fall and the winter, you know they are really booked. So there's a need for an investment in infrastructure and an investment in new systems, but it needs to be matched with an ongoing, you know, commitment and demand for that need over time. Thank you. Um, I am aware that we don't have meat farmers on our, on our panel, so I wanted to make sure that we had a little bit of an opportunity to talk about that because there is a lot there. Um, all right. Um, we have a question in the comments about, um, we actually have a couple of questions about the labor pool, um, people who are um, working on farms. Um, so I think that maybe I'll direct this one to you also, Margaret, um, just anything that you've heard. Um, so the question is um, that the askers heard that some, that some workers are not going back to work because um, their income has Im improved with state and federal unemployment and that that is impacting uh, the number of people who are available to work on farms. Um, so the question is, um, has that, or the, that's happening um, across industries. So the question is, have we heard that that is an issue that's happening on farms as well? Um, and are wages that are being offered to farm workers being positively influenced by that pressure. Have you heard anything um, about that locally or nationally, I guess? Yeah, I, I'll be interested in, in Ben and Caroline's comments too about um, finding workers. I, I do know just what Scott's alluding to that, that 
you know, there are right now um, some workers who can do better with unemployment than at work. I have not heard of specific impacts of that on agricultural workers, but that's not, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. I, I do think there is a lot of uncertainty around the agricultural workforce this summer. There's been a lot of um, uncertainty around guest workers who have arrived on um, H-2A visas more slowly than usual, but do seem to be arriving back on the farms that many of them have worked on for a very long time and bring a lot of skill and knowledge to. Um, and I think we really don't know how a lot of the other um, changes in employment are going to play out on farms. So I think that's a place where uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. So I don't know, Ben or Caroline, if, if you have anything to add. Um, sure. Ben, you, um, you want to go ahead? Sure. So um, it's actually going going to Margaret's point. I mean, I just saw there was a statistic today in the Times that said up to 40% of the 28 million that are currently laid off may not have jobs that ever come back. So, um, I mean, in terms of the labor pool, I, I know what Scott's asking about. I've heard in other industries of people who are making more um, in, on unemployment. Um, the state, we're, we're fortunate that the state is very generous with unemployment. Other states are not that way. Um, we've had an issue for years, and Caroline can attest this as well, as minimum wage has gone up in the state, which is, is great for the workers, but um, you know, the, we are also competing for the same people. So we, you know, we, we can't be paying the agricultural rates um, and expect to get someone who is gonna be, you know, staying on your farm and, and wanting to, to work for you. Um, so, I mean, we've been able to, as, as a retail, primarily retail operation, we can pass the increased labor cost along through a product. Um, it's a little different when you're wholesaling, but um, you ju just have to adjust accordingly. Um, the, the, we've actually personally, we've been getting, I've been getting a lot of unsolicited emails, people looking for work, um, you know, no real farm experience, but they've been laid off. Um, I've been reluctant, um, and actually we have the same issue in the farmer's market. Um, we have an assistant manager position open, but a lot of people applying that are currently out of work and we're, we're, we don't wanna hire somebody who, you know, may in a month be going back to work and will be leaving you. So um, it definitely is a balance, um, but so far I haven't, uh, other than the H2A issues, um, which getting guest workers in, um, for the most part, um, I've been, yeah, I mean, my former employees are, are looking for part-time work and coming back to me. Um, I don't know, Caroline can speak to that as well. She has a larger labor pool right now. Yeah. All right, Caroline. I, um, our farm is very lucky. We have a lot of our employees who return to the farm year after year on many of my management team who stay on year round. Um, so I really didn't have many positions that I was hiring for this spring. Um, I am seeing a lot more applicants, though. Um, like Ben was saying, non-traditional farm applicants, uh, people who had worked in food and um, hospitality, who are, you know, interested uh, but don't have experience, and are saying, "Well, now time, no time like now to get my hands dirty and give it a shot." But um, I'm hesitant to hire somebody who's just looking for a summer experience on my farm. September, October, we grow a lot of peppers. We do a lot of processing. Um, that's our peak, important, really busy time. So I'm looking to have people who can stay through the full season. Um, it's very important for us. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it has given me a larger pool from which to, to consider, um, but it hasn't really changed things for us. Thanks. Um, there was another question about whether there are new um, job or volunteer opportunities for young people whose um, other summer job opportunities have dwindled. So I think that you, you both answered that um, as well. So thank you for that. Um, so I have a question about volume. <laughs> um, I know that's, a, that's an interesting intro. Um, so Caroline, you were talking about the um, enormous demand that you've seen for home delivery and no contact food pickups. Um, and we've heard the same from farm stands and garden centers that are open for the season now. Um, but we're still pretty early in the season. Uh, so that means that for most farms, volume of production is still relatively low. And there are a number of farms that aren't open for the season yet. 
Um, so I'm curious about how you see that playing out for your farm or for the Sunderland Farm Collaborative as a group um, as we go into the height of the growing season and just the amount of food that you're growing um, increases so dramatically and how you're sort of thinking about that at this point in the season. Yeah, so it we are definitely moving a lot of food through the Sunderland Farm Collaborative um, and delivering it to people. Um, however, the delivery mechanism is very sort of um, small and bottlenecked, you know, individual consumers, one box, one home location. Um, it's pallets and pallets of food that we're delivering every day, but it's only twice a week. And re relative to the volume of produce that we grow, and that all of our other participating farms in the collaborative who were mostly um, wholesale oriented farms, the scale of what we can deliver to individuals in a box twice a week is very small relative to our volume that we grow and produce. So when we've been accustomed to shipping out, you know, eight pallets a day, every day to various wholesale customers on a schedule in various states, um, I still am very much needing, even with the Sunderland Farm Collaborative, which we're, you know, grateful that it seems to be working um, and is providing very meaningful sales to a lot of the participating farms. Like we still need to have uh, very strong sales through other wholesale channels. So there's still a lot of anxiety about that unknown, um, you know, exactly what restaurant buying ability will be, what sort of service they're going to be able to do two months from now, whether the schools will be able to open and serve meals in September. There are a lot of big questions that are still hanging. Um, and while this new delivery option is, uh, is meaningful, it does not answer all of those for us. Yes, um, Margaret, I want to ask you a similar question, but on a different scale. Um, that is a really helpful perspective um, from how you're seeing it at your own business level, Caroline. Um, so Margaret, I'm curious what your thoughts are about, um, you know, we've, we know that demand for local food is high at the moment, um, but I'm curious based on what you've been hearing, um, whether you think that we have systems in place yet to accommodate just the sheer volume of perishable food that's going to be available in August or September, um, and how you see that playing out uh, across our food system. Yeah, I don't, I think in a lot of ways we do not know the answer to this question yet. So many of our larger wholesale vegetable farms sell a lot of product through food service. And, you know, you all know, like, if you look at the statistics, we eat a lot of our food. We buy it from restaurants or we buy it, you know, through college or office or school food service. Like we, a lot of our food, we don't eat at home anymore. I mean, now we eat it at home, but we didn't used to. So that shift in markets, you know, ideally we hope nobody's eating less food. People are getting enough food. That's obviously a challenge. That's a big question in and of itself, but Ideally, we're not eating less. We're just getting it in different places. Um, but I, I think it's really, um, we really are going to wait, have to wait to see. I think if there are a lot of efforts at the state level to connect local farms to food banks and other emergency food distribution, and if we can do that, I think that could be an enormous help um, in making sure that the food we grow here um, has a place to go. Um, so I, and I think the state approach of really focusing on infrastructure for local farms um, is a good approach to try to think about how do we build this so it will work um, in the long time, in the long term. Um, Andy Cox, uh, who's the dining service director at Smith College, asked a question in the chat about, he said, what do we, you know, what might go unsold? What should we be planning to eat more of? And, and suggested, you know, he could work on the menus that he's writing or that they develop for Smith to use the products that might not otherwise have homes. So that is a very creative approach. And if we can do that kind of thing, and, I, and I'm thinking, what is the answer to Andy's question? And I, don't, I can think of a few things. Butternut squash is something that I think a lot of squash moves through food service. But I think figuring out the answer to that question, what might go unsold, and then 
bringing that kind of creative and innovative attention to what can we do about it, it we will really need in order to make that work. Um, Process yeah, that is another answer. Sorry. That's fine. Um, so that I think um, leads me to a maybe related question. Um, and it's something that you've alluded to already, Margaret, which is that um, work on fruit and vegetable farms started months ago, even though it still feels like it's relative, relatively early in the growing season. Um, so farmers have been needing to make a lot of decisions about crop plans and that sort of thing um, with so many unknowns about what the season's going to look like. Um, so Caroline, I wanted to ask you um, if you've made any changes uh, on your farm in terms of how, how you're thinking about what to grow and what to focus on. Um, and if you have any comments on the previous question, feel free to go ahead. Yeah. So we did not drastically alter our crop plan. Um, we grow large quantities of a lot of different things and a lot of specialty things. Um, so there is some risk there, you know, will individuals in the valley want as many fava beans as I'm growing? Time will tell. Um, you know, certain things that restaurant chefs go crazy for that aren't maybe as familiar to home cooks. Um, but we did not really alter the crop plan too much. Um, the previous comments about volume, uh, the thing that's on my mind and the decisions that we are making every day right now, um, we were able to pivot and transition and create the Sunderland Farm Collaborative in a very short period of time because of the time of the year. In March and April, I had staff, I have facilities, I have barns and warehouses and coolers that I've built for my farm and I had vehicles um, that were you know, not being used to their full capacity at that time of year. And so we just sort of employed all of these resources that I had on my farm and used them in this new way and got it started rolling immediately. Uh, but now that our season is really heating up and we're harvesting, you know, five days a week, my staff is busy harvesting, my vehicles are busy delivering our farm products, um, even aside from the collaborative endeavors, and my coolers are filling up. And I'm realizing that in order to have my farm facility infrastructure able to accommodate the scale of products coming in from 30 farms and shipping out every other day on top of what we're growing and processing and washing and packing and storing in the cooler and delivering um i now need to make all new infrastructure investments and i'm buying vehicles and looking to build another cooler because when i start harvesting my you know fall storage crops in october the cooler that i've been using for the collaborative is going to be busy and full so um you know i'm i'm right now being you know, confronted with very, very big investments that I need to make in order to continue what I'm doing um, because it's, it has taken over my farm and my farm actually needs my farm <laughs> to continue operating. So, so those are some like major, um, and you know, so this thing came from the collaborative was a response to COVID and um, a response to an immediate need uh, for consumers to find a safe way to access food and for growers to find a, a way to sell what they had and what they were producing. Um, but we're thinking that this is likely to continue to be uh, a, a valid and useful delivery mechanism for local produce and that people are gonna hopefully consider it uh, you know, a service that's worth, worth pursuing in the future. So we're looking to make it possible to continue long term but it's it's unknown whether the demand that exists now will continue so it's a risky investment moment for us to to know whether it's a smart move or not yeah um ben i know that it's different for an orchard because of the extremely long-term planning that you all do in terms of your crops um, but i'm just curious about whether uh, coronavirus has affected any of your sort of short-term planning um, in, in similar ways. Sure, sorry. Um, uh, 
So yes, I mean, we obviously, we plant, when we plant a tree in the ground, we wait three years to harvest. Um, so obviously we can't really change what we already, <laughs> what, our, what our crop is going, uh, going to be for the most part. Um, I mean, we do some, some like row crops, some pumpkins and squash that um, right now though, with personally with, the re with a retail store and planning to do you know, similar delivery or um, curbside pickup, uh, we're, we're not planning to alter any of our crop plan in, in that sense. Um, you know, we're, we're optimistic, trying to be optimistic that, you know, there already is a great, we're in a great area and that we have, um, you know, great customers. And, um, you know, I, I think Caroline could attest that, you know, the really strong connection of farms and, and customers, um, people really interested in local food, thanks to CISA and, and other organizations. And, and um, so I think that in, in this area, we're a little unique. Um, I know, you know, from other growers, like I was saying that, I mean, operations that rely mostly on pick your own, they are really stressed out because they're used to having thousands of people jammed in on a weekend and they don't know really right now how they're, I mean, to answer the question of perishability, you know, and the state is doing a lot of work that MDR has actually put up a new site of connecting farms, um, you know, trying to get, get infrastructure going, you know, storages and other things. But a lot of these places don't even have the storage capacity, you know, that they could pick it all or that they have the labor. So, um, and of course you could go to a food bin, food, food, you know, there are, there are options of where the food could go, but, the rev, you know, the revenues of, for the farmer is so far down. It's going to be really hard for them to continue operating uh, in the same model. So, um, so yeah, there is there definitely are a lot of challenges, and we we unfortunately we can't alter how many apples. We, and we have a great pollination this year. So this year, you know, it's, apples are in full bloom this week, and we have great pollination, which is great. But um, it's just it can be stressful for some growers if you don't know where your crop's going to go. Um, all right, thank you. So we are getting to the end of our time for the Q&A before I turn it over to Sean for uh, voting. I see that there is some conversation in the chat that I don't think we're going to have a chance to get to. So I encourage you um, to follow up directly with CISA uh, through the info at buylocalfood.org email address, or if you have a particular person you already talked to, go ahead. Um, but I do want to invite all the panelists, and I'll, I'll go through and check in with you, um, to quickly uh, respond to this last question, which is that um, clearly we are in a very challenging circumstance, and we know that there is going to continue to be a lot of hardship for lots of people because of the crisis that we're in. Um, but as I think many of you have alluded to, we're also in a moment where people people's existing habits are being disrupted and local businesses are making big changes and connecting with new people. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts um, and maybe we can start with you, Margaret, um, about the future and what you see as the opportunities here or just the hopes for what can come out of this as we move through it as a community. I think, you know, one of the things when, Claire, when you asked this question that made me think about is that um, farming is always an act of faith. Like you put a seed in the ground and then there are a whole lot of factors that you don't have any control over that influence whether you're able to harvest that crop and whether you're able to sell it at a price that makes your farm business work. And I feel like what's happening now is that farmers putting that seed in the ground are kind of stretching that faith even more. Um, and everyone who works on a farm or in a food business is taking a risk for themselves and their families that those of us that can work from home don't have to take. Um, and it's, of course, you know, all of us, we can, there's a lot of risks related to farming that we still have no control over. We can't control the weather. But there are other parts of that risk that we can try as a community to make good on. And, and some of that is voting with our wallets and prioritizing local purchasing. And some of it is trying to fix all of these broken pieces of our system that don't work for workers and don't work for our environment and make it really challenging to make a farm business work. And, and recognize that the resilience and the value of having agriculture and growing food all over the place um, and make 
you know, work for the changes that can make that really work over the long term. So I guess I feel like I want to match, like I want us to match the faith that farmers are demonstrating with our own faith and hard work uh, so that that risk will come through. Um, ben, do you have anything to add on that question? I, I would just say quickly that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, trying to be optimistic. It's, you know, as a farmer, you sort of have to be optimistic because there's always, there's always something as Margaret alluded to. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that the, you know, the state has been, we've, we've had good leadership and I'm hoping that, you know, the trends of the slow reopening uh, will um, really help us. And that, you know, as, I think, I think, you know, we have such a strong, especially in this valley, the, the education sector that we really need the colleges back. And I, and I mean, in terms of, of our economy, um, you know, getting the, the colleges back, getting restaurants, hopefully open, um, you know, getting some of these places that farms can sell to, because otherwise there are, is going to be a lot of product that is going to have to go to food banks because people won't be able to, you know, won't have jobs and won't be able to afford it. Um, so, I mean, that's, I'm just, I'm optimistic that, you know, by the fall, we'll have some things back to normal. We're not going to be, I agree with Caroline, that this is, I think, you know, having these delivery models, I, I think it's great. This is going to replace the, you know, go fresh or hello, whatever the, all those services, you know, I think those are done and hopefully the, the local ones will take over. Um, so that's my hope. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic. Caroline, do you have anything that you want to add? Um, the brightest light for me in this situation has been the network of farms that I'm working with, with the Sunderland Farm Collaborative, and also um, with Mass Food Deliveries, the, with Julia from Mycoterra, who has a similar sort of business uh, launched the same time. There's a lot of just knowledge and resource sharing and, you know, pitching in to lend a vehicle or, you know, talk through systems and troubleshooting um, and then also just the network of all of the farm stores that are experiencing this new retail boom uh, as local customers seek them out because they are afraid to go shop at the large grocery store and you know the network of farms really providing the food to meet that sudden growing demand um, it's been really awesome to you know, relationships, I've been farming in the Valley for 15 years now. Um, and I have a lot of really strong relationships that have really only gotten stronger through this, um, finding ways to target new opportunities and pull our, our products together. Um, you know, I think that we're showing our area and our region and our community and our neighbors that we have a lot of what you need and we're growing it here. And we are so lucky as a result. Thank you. Um, anyone else, Phil, do you want to pipe up or um, anyone else want to say anything? Okay. Um, well, I'll just note that we're seeing a lot of really great offers uh, for connection and ideas pop up in the chat. So that feels hopeful and optimistic to me. It's great to have such an engaged group of people who are here tonight. Um, so we have one final piece of business, um, which is voting on CESA's board. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean Robinson, who is the vice chair of CESA's board, who is going to walk us through an extremely quick board election. And thanks to everyone who stays on to help us take care of this. Thank you, Claire. Hello, my name is Sean Robinson, and I serve as vice chair, chairperson of the CESA board of directors. Thank you all for being here tonight and for your support of CESA. I'd like to explain the voting process. Uh, each nominee will be voted on to serve a three-year term. As was, as was mentioned earlier, you can find bios of each of these nominees and a link being posted in the chat. In a minute, we will activate a poll. A uh, box will pop up on your screen, allowing you to vote. We are now going to ask CESA members to vote on incoming board members. To be eligible to vote, you must be a CESA member. We define a CESA member as someone who believes in CESA's mission and has made a donation to CESA in the past calendar year. To vote in favor of accepting the slate as presented, answer aye. Those opposed, answer nay. I move the slate as proposed. Can I second? Please indicate your vote by responding to the poll. We'll have 10 seconds of silence for voting. All right. 
Voting has now closed. Let's see the results. Yippee! Thank you, everyone. Yay. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations to new board members. I look forward to serving with each of you. Uh, now I will turn it back over to Claire. I'm going to grab it from Claire, and I'm just going to welcome all the new board members. And I also just want to share a huge appreciation for the board members who have left us this year. Sasha Palmer, Beth Lorenz, Casey Steinberg of Old Friends Farm, and Ben, the good Ben Clark, thank God. Both uh, Casey and Ben served for nine years, and Ben and I worked closely together as he was the chair for a number of years. So please remember the links you've seen. Remember you can reach out to us whenever. And I do want to sort of follow up on the panelists' answers around you know, what we can look forward to. And I do want to say that I feel that like this time really has challenged and tested a lot of us to our limits. And I don't feel the question before us is how do we go back to normal? Because that normal allowed people to go hungry, it permitted racism to define if someone had a job or a home or was healthy. And it promoted the control of the marketplace and our food sources to the largest of corporate farms and food businesses. I think the question is how can we all join together to move forward in this world as a nation, as a community that feeds each other, celebrates each other's differences and stands with each other when a wrong is done to make it right. So I think there is a lot of good work to do right now. Um, our panelists have shown us some ideas for how we can move forward. And I say like, roll up our sleeves, find your local farmer and food store, share the harvest broadly, and change policies in the system now. So I do hope and even pray that I get to see you all in person again next year. And when we do that, I really hope that we feel that in this upcoming year that we feel we have co-created a year that is one we're proud to hand off to our children and our children's children. Thank you all so much for your time, your passion, your creativity. Thank you panelists, stay safe and healthy. And back to Claire. Um, all right, so we, have done it. Thank you all so much for joining us and thanks to all of our panelists for coming on and we are going to sign off. Have a good night. Thank you, Claire, too. Bye. Bye, Bye all. Thank you for coming. <laughs>